Good morning. It's 830 on Monday, February 19th. I'm Desiree Frazier. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. On today's show, the Mississippi Senate is expected to file legislation today to provide Medicaid benefits to the working poor. Then, advocates for the rights of black women in Mississippi meet with lawmakers seeking better working conditions, higher wages, and quality health insurance. Plus, severe droughts have already caused delays in timber production in the state, but a booming population of pine beetles could make those conditions even worse. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Members of Mississippi Senate expected to file a bill today prior to the first legislative deadline of the session that could grow the state's Medicaid system. And by growing, that means interest among lawmakers to expand Medicaid. But many Republicans remain concerned about how full expansion under the Affordable Care Act could affect the state's taxpayers. The proposal would increase eligibility to people making up to 138 percent of the federal poverty level or just over $20,000 for an individual. Lawmakers say this could help cover the gap of people who work but can't afford private health insurance. In total, this could increase Medicaid rolls by roughly 230,000 participants. Republican Lieutenant Governor Delbert Hoseman speaks with our Will Stribling about the bill proposed. He says health care in the state is in crisis. Many low-income residents need the financial support to get medical treatment. During the campaign, we talked about the fact that we believe working people should have an access to health care. And it's reflected, in addition to our moral uh, Christian review of having people have the ability to have affordable health care, it goes back to the labor force participation rate, which is much driving the current conversation. Um, we in Mississippi have dropped to about a 53.9 percent. I think the lowest in the country of our people between 16 and 65 or so are actually working now. And part of that is we're not healthy. And uh, I, I believe that keeping us healthy in that 16 to 64 bracket, you know, your major income years, keeping us healthy is a critical component to raising the labor force participation rate. And when they're working, people buy homes, help raise their families, uh, are productive members of society, pay taxes, uh, all all those kinds of things that we we would hope every American could espouse to. And in this process, we're talking about people that are working up to uh, probably about $41,000 or so that they would have access to a health care process and that they would be making a contribution. So there's a dual requirement here. You're working and you pay part of your premiums. Now, those admittedly will be less than the full amount of premiums, but I think it's important for them to have some some contribution. Uh, I think it makes makes it important that they feel like they've contributed in, in their own self-worth and what they're doing, as well as deferring some of the cost to the state. So I think that's important. And with those two requirements that you're working and you're putting in some money into the system, uh, we want to have it affordable. Yeah, and those those two requirements you mentioned, the, the work requirement has pre- precedent. CMS has granted waivers for that in other state. But this individual contribution, if I understand, Mississippi would be the first state to do something like that. What does that process look like, getting getting that waiver? And are y'all concerned about about the federal government being being open to that to that to that new kind of waiver? We're hopeful, and of course, when this hits up there, we may have a new federal government. When we when we do this process, um, this will be the end of one term, or maybe the extension, depending on who gets elected. But um, I think when you look at what will happen with this, uh, the amount of people, which we think is, and our state economists have said about two hundred thirty thousand, others have said two fifty. Uh, two hundred fifty thousand, maximum of three hundred thousand. That's the highest number I've seen. So somewhere in that 230 to 300,000 people would be available for this. I think that Washington will help us in getting approval, and we'll be able to proceed. Uh, we also anticipate re- raising revenue from other sources so that this will be revenue neutral for the state. We won't have any money in it, uh, any state funds in it, and we anticipate somewhere the projections are somewhere between five and $800 million positive uh, income for the state of Mississippi. 
Yeah. Can you, can you say anything yet about where those other funds would come from so that they wouldn't be coming from the general funds? They'll be in the bill, and I want to see it. Um, we've had general discussions, but I'd, I'd like to see the bill. I, I can't guarantee you where it would be. Clearly, uh, the hospitals have expressed an interest in contributing. Folks on the other side of the aisle have been pushing for this for years. Is those two extra requirements that made any inroads and in convincing some um, some folks on your side that were that were hesitant about about supporting this this sort of expansion in the past? Yeah, I think clearly our conservative Republicans have two very good traits. One is they can add, and where they see uh, we're going to have a net positive revenue stream, that's good. And the second. They have concern for their fellow man and woman. Uh, we passed postpartum last year. That came out of the Senate to where individuals who have had a baby have health care coverage for 12 months. And so uh, I think you see this as, as a continuing process by the Republican leadership in the House and in the Senate to make sure that we're having people that are healthy and can work and continue to work. That's Republican Lieutenant Governor Delbert Hoseman speaking about a bill expected to be filed today. The language of that measure is unknown at this time, but many health care providers hope it could reduce financial strain during an economic crisis for hospitals as well. But one thing that is clear, that original bill will not bring full Medicaid expansion under the Affordable Care Act, like many Democrats hoped. Dr. John Goday is a pediatrician in Hattiesburg and a professor of medicine at William Carey University. He was the author of a ballot initiative in 2022 that would have moved the state into full Medicaid expansion. He tells our Will Stribling this bill could still help many hospitals and low-income Mississippians, but it won't have the full benefits of the Affordable Care Act. I'm so glad that uh, the lieutenant governor has informed uh, Mississippians that he is putting this bill together to come from someone like him. I think is just a, a testimony to his leadership on this uh, and also his ability to see the value and the benefit of having a healthy population, uh, not just for workforce development, which I think is very important, but also to help individuals be their best selves to meet their potential, whether that's raising a family, whether that's volunteering in the community, whether that's working at a job. Um, you know, If we have a healthier population, we want to see our numbers and the metrics get better. But the reason why we want to see those numbers improve is so we can have a healthier and happier and more productive population I don't see this bill as a panacea, but it is a piece of the puzzle. It is something that we, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way that we can all pull together and work together uh, towards um, helping get Mississippi off the bottom. And, and I hear that the speaker will also be introducing similar legislation in the House. So to me, this is really a thing of beauty to see our elected representatives prioritizing uh, the health of Mississippians in this way. Well, Lieutenant Governor said that this uh, this isn't going to be just a, a, a clean expansion bill like we've seen other states uh, adopt. It's going to have a few qualifiers. It's going to um, include a work requirement, individual contribution requirement for the beneficiary. What do you think about these these extra qualifiers uh, being included for, for folks to qualify? These are fine details that uh, I believe are worthy of discussion and putting on the table uh, now, from a philosophical standpoint, I believe uh, I view Medicaid or the Medicaid program uh, as health insurance and uh, n- not as a like a uh, like a, a benefit program uh, sort of thing. Uh, I think that access to health care is something that humans uh, should, uh, you know, that Americans and Mississippians should expect. Uh, to have uh, here in the greatest uh, country on earth. <clears throat> and and so uh, I, I view this program as a way to ac- increase access to health care. And the best way to do that uh, is, you know, everybody will put in their uh, opinions about the best way to do it and, and work it out. I will tell you, you know, because Medicaid is a is a joint venture between the federal and the state government. 
um, it's the kind of thing that you know, there needs to be um, some sort of a, um, a working out of those details, and and I think that we will be able to work out those details. Uh, but in terms of you know how to implement the program, there's a lot of good ideas about that, and I'm just happy that we're having the discussion right now. Dr. John Godet is a pediatrician in Hattiesburg. Coming up, the Black Women's Roundtable meets with legislators about ways to protect women in the workplace. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Hi, I'm Dr. Susan Buttress, host of Southern Remedies, Relatively Speaking. Join the conversation every Tuesday at 11 as we dissect issues that are important to you and your family. That's Relatively Speaking, Tuesdays only on MPB Think Radio. Connect with the people looking to connect with you. Become an underwriter with Mississippi Public Broadcasting. For more information, go to mpbonline.org slash more slash underwriting. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Desiree Frazier. Mississippi Black Women's Roundtable is meeting with lawmakers to discuss ways the state can protect women. Those issues include changes to closing gaps in wages and health care for women. Among the advocates is Lakeisha Preston of Lawrence County, an employee at the government contractor Maximus Call Center in Hattiesburg. She tells Gulf States Newsroom's reporter Maya Miller, many women at the call center have struggled and do struggle with getting fair salaries and benefits. During the time of working with Maximus, I was commuting back and forth um, from my from home to work, and that's like an hour and 15 minutes apart. So by doing that during the time, I've come to realize that Maximus is, is rare time. It's really hard to struggle from, you know, struggling the time to time with them. Um, the pay doesn't, it doesn't help out that much. The health insurance doesn't help out that much. Um, The out-of-pocket cost is very high. Um, So I had a hard time with me and my son. I had to move back home with my parents. Pretty much my story is mostly like struggle. If you're a single parent and you don't have anyone to help, then you're on your own because Maximus cannot help you. The pay doesn't work. The health coverage doesn't work. Mississippi is... Oh, it's, it's, it's slow, it's slow, it's slow. So with Medicaid, health insurance for a child, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. So do you have Medicaid right now? No, only my son does. I do have health coverage with my at, at work with Maximus, but the co-payments are still expensive. The high pocket costs are still expensive. They did change it, um, get a chance to um, reduce it from 4500 to 2500 for the deductible. But it's still it's still high because you have to meet your deductible first before the insurance company starts to pay anything. And twenty five hundred dollars, that's yeah, that's a lot. That's a that's a you gotta like break your leg or something, and then. But can you get like a like a wellness check? Um yes, I can still get a wellness check. I can still get a wellness check and all of those good things. Those those are the major part of health insurance marketplace like as you stated like going to the emergency room yes you have to meet your deductible first so they're going to charge you that plus more and there you go with a high bill so I was stuck with that high bill for so long in 2023 last year I was finally able to pay that off and my loans because of that so my story consists of all of that from 2019 to now 2023 what are some things that you wish you had? Like, I know I know there are so many things that, like you said, it's a struggle, but, like, what are some things that you just, that would make your life better as a mother? I wish I had more resourceful information back then than I do now. Then I didn't know anything. I'm a first-time mom. I didn't know anything. Yeah, I had my mom, but I didn't know anything. And there's a lot of mothers, parents out there like that, don't know nothing. So I I needed the resources. I didn't have the resources. Yeah, you can read up on the internet anytime, but who have time for that when you got to go to work? You have a sick child. You were sick yourself. So the more resources you have, the more knowledge you have, the more better things will be, but I didn't have that then. I wish I would have had more pay at that time frame. I wouldn't have been in the situation I was in. I wish I would have had more sick time at the time. I would have been in the situation I'm in now. So yeah, all of those would have been a more more efficient now than it was then. 
If you don't mind me asking, was it minimum wage? Yes, minimum wage was 905. That's Lakeisha Preston of Lawrence County. She's a worker at the Maximus Call Center and is calling on lawmakers for better protections for women. Coming up, pine beetles, an exploding population in the state, and its effects on the timber industry and communities. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Hi, I'm Dr. Susan Buttress, host of Southern Remedies, Relatively Speaking. Join the conversation every Tuesday at 11 as we dissect issues that are important to you and your family. That's Relatively Speaking, Tuesdays only on MPB Think Radio. What can you do with the MPB Radio app? Listen live, hear local news, view the schedule, make a contribution, listen to shows on demand, and interact with social media. Get the app for your smartphone now. Start your work week with a morning of locally produced programs on MPB Think Radio. At 9, it's Deep South Dining featuring conversations about Southern cuisine. Hear interviews with interesting Mississippians on Now You're Talking at 10. And at 11, there's information on leading a healthy life on Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Desiree Frazier. Foresters in Mississippi anticipating a sharp rise in some bark beetle populations this spring. As temperatures gradually warm, that's a problem because those beetles will target pine trees that are already vulnerable from the severe droughts this past summer. Already Madison County is seeing pine trees dying, experts warning they will fall down eventually. Curtis Vanderschaff, a forestry specialist at the Mississippi State University Extension Service, tells our Mike McEwen there are three types of Ips beetles. They are expected to feed on pine trees heavily this season, posing a serious threat to the state's timber industry and some communities. Why this coming spring is going to be an issue? Well, because those station levels rose, say, in 2023, the summer, and then going into November, and therefore those beetles overwintered, right? They had larvae and pupa. They they had broad, I guess you could say, B-R-O-O-D, and therefore they are likely overwintering in the trees, and they will come out probably beginning in March or April as temperatures get generally, we believe, around 60 degrees and up to around 100 degrees, and therefore that's, those are temperatures that are really going to create problems for uh, infestations with Ips beetles. And do Ips beetles pose any particular risk to any special species of trees in Mississippi? Uh, pine trees. That can be loblolly, slash, shortleaf, and longleaf. And then I believe we have an occasional spruce pine. Um, and there are maybe perhaps some Christmas trees, Virginia pine. The most susceptible generally, we believe, are loblolly pine and shortleaf pine because they don't have the pitch or the resin levels that longleaf and slash pine do. And what are but, some of those risks? Well, those risks are going to be basically tree mortality. So any time a tree becomes infested with ips, there's really not much you can do to cure that tree. So the tree is going to die. And that obviously is a loss financially in a forested setting where people are counting on revenue from harvesting those trees. But in a yard setting, that can be the loss of visual aesthetics to a house. It can you know, be a loss of shade to some extent, pine shade houses. And beyond that, it can, it can cause serious issues or concerns about damage uh, to property, to power lines, as well as loss of life, both animals and and people, and then severe uh, destruction to uh, houses, let's say, that can be very, uh, very costly. To what degree would Ips beetles have on killing trees in some forests, and maybe not necessarily large stands, but maybe worsening a wildfire risk with dead trees and dead vegetation? Would they contribute to that anymore? They, They would definitely contribute to that. But they're, they're, they're going to be a little bit, as I said, so if you had a 100-acre stand, they, they may hurt half acre at most here or there. So um, I don't know if the Ips beetles themselves are going to create 
major wildfire catastrophes themselves, but paired with poor forest management, uh, you know, high stand density stands that can be attractive for southern pine beetle, they can create problems. Now, if we have another drought, probably more of a concern for wildfire than Ips beetles themselves is going to be another drought. Because Ips beetles, like I said, they're, they're going to kind of, they're going to create mortality in little pockets here or there. And so therefore, in a forested setting, I don't know if they're going to necessarily lead to a great probability of wildfire it's, uh, themselves. But paired with another severe drought where all the trees in a, in a forested area have low vigor, once again, that's going to create major issues for wildfire. Now, if southern pine beetle takes off and kills hundreds of, of acres, you know, uh, and, and you have people, their 100-acre forests are being, you know, decimated by southern pine beetle and all that mortality, southern pine beetle can greatly contribute to, to wildfire risk of an individual landowner. But I think the, the bigger thing is, is the drought. Again, if we have another drought this summer, the amount of moisture that we're getting this winter to help recharge the, the, the soil, the loss of moisture in the soil that we had from this previous summer, 2023, and then the, the problems with southern pine beetle. Uh, if southern pine beetle takes off, then, then, then I think you're going to have more concern about wildfires related to beetles than necessarily the ips. And to your knowledge, is it common at all for southern pine and ips beetles to be present and competing perhaps in the same geographic area or do does one kind of cancel the other one out no they, they they can they can be found in the same forested area which comes first kind of depends on where the beetles are so southern pine beetle as i said it's kind of a little more cyclic uh i think ips beetles are more common everywhere you know every year they're kind of probably have they're, they're more widely distributed maybe than southern pine beetle but the problem is southern pine beetle can can take off. So uh, I would think in general, based on the behavior this past year, Ips beetles are going to be the initial attacker, and then southern pine beetle may just kind of follow, come through, and, and follow the Ips. Uh, but in areas where we have, you know, uh, regular infestations of southern pine beetles, um, say for instance near the National Forest, they may be the initial attacker and then followed by Ips because once again, Ips, Ips is only going to basically attack unhealthy trees. Southern pine beetle is probably going to initially attack unhealthy trees, but it has the ability to kill and to attack and kill healthy trees. Um, Ips are not usually going to attack healthy trees. Curtis Van Der Schaaf, a forestry specialist at the Mississippi State University Extension Center. This has been Mississippi Edition.